Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Dreamcatcher webinar series. My name is Dinora Gonzalez, and I am the project manager for the project Dreamcatcher. The Freeport McMoran Foundation created this program in partnership with the Thunderbird for Good. This is a free business training for Native American women entrepreneurs. We host select selected participants for an intensive week of training on Thunderbird campus in downtown Phoenix. This has been doing for since 2015, and we are super excited today about this webinar. We have these young storytellers, and they're going to tell us the stories about the resilience and success in their life. I want to introduce to you our host, Taylor Nota. Taylor is the senior editor at ASU Turning Points Magazine. This is the first magazine written by and for Native American students. Welcome, Taylor. Hi everyone, Yat Ed. Thank you for having us today, Denora. Um, so I'll start off with a quick introduction and then I want to dive into what Turning Points Magazine is at EXU. So Yat Ed, A Taylor Nota Yanishia, Tetchi Inishlin, the Totichini Justine, no da at Dina at Deshache, do Tetchini Deshinale, at Ekosdo, Dishigan. Hello everyone, again, my name is Taylor. I am a Dine wordsmith, originally from the Navajo Nation of St. Michael's, Arizona. I graduated from ASU in 2018 with my bachelor's in journalism, as well as American Indian Studies. I am also a member of the Native American Journalist Association. And since graduating, I have been working for Turning Points Magazine as senior editor for almost two years exactly this month. So again, thank you, Denora and Project Dreamcatcher for providing space today for us to share our stories with everyone. Um, I'm really excited to join in on today's conversation because I'm always inspired by what Brittany and Nicolette are up to, the stories that they have to share. They're just amazing women that I've had the pleasure of working with and learning from. <clears throat> so quickly, to share a little bit more about Trinity Plains Magazine, we are the first Native student publication in the country that is made entirely by and for Native college students at Arizona State. Our publication is housed within the Center for Indian Education, which is located on ASU's Tempe campus. Um, from stories to the graphic design, our magazine is the product of when Indigenous scholars, creators, and storytellers unite with the purpose of providing resources and stories to help enable the success of Native American students as they pursue their higher education pathways. And to give a brief history about Turning Points, um, Turning Points first started off as an idea in 2015, 2016. Um, it was the brainchild of indigenous scholars, doctors, Amanda Tetchini and Brian Brayboy, who envisioned a sort of tangible resource that is specifically geared towards indigenous college students that is used to not only share stories, but also insider information about college pathways because unfortunately, not all of our students know what's available to them on campus. And this ties into research that they did early on where um, they each went out to ASUs for campuses and hosted sessions where they asked students directly What's your college experience like? How can ASU better serve you and support you and future Native students? And a lot of feedback that they received, they kept hearing over and over again, I wish I knew about this resource before this, or I wish I knew about this service before dot, dot, dot. And they also heard students saying they feel lonely in their classes, they're the only Native in their classes. And I think the most powerful feedback that they got was students saying they feel invisible. So through these early conversations, it became evident that so many students were finding out about campus resources and support very late in their college journey. And, you know, these are resources that they could have utilized much sooner. So following this research, um, Ted Sheetney and Brayboy, they brainstormed ways that they could one, share student narratives about the Native student experience so that all of our students could be seen and heard on campus and in their classrooms. Two, provide insider information on navigating college through a Native lens. And three, have it be in a format where it is 
it's literally a tangible guide that could easily fit inside of your bag. You know, it's compact enough to fit on the inside of your binder pocket so that students could carry it with them, could refer to it as they're walking on campus. So in essence, with the help of others with an ASU, our magazine was created. It's a 28 page native student guide. We publish one issue each spring and fall semester and we mail them out to our um, self-identified native students at ASU as well as our staff, faculty, and tribal leaders across Arizona. And I, I would say that right now we're wrapping up on our fifth issue. So I'm very excited about that. And yeah, we're also an award-winning award magazine. Um, we're recognized as a university publication. And I should mention that other various tribal colleges and universities have followed suit in creating their own resource as well. So yeah, with that, I'm excited to hear from, again, Brittany and Nicolette for having us. And as a Deneth journalist, I believe that, you know, our narratives matter and that's something that we try to instill with our students at ASU. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Taylor. So we're going to start, who wants to be first? Okay, Brittany. Okay, let me share my screen. And then, okay, it looks like a lot of slides, um, but I promise it's gonna go much faster because a lot of it's visuals. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thank you for having me here and everyone for uh, zooming into this discussion. I'm happy to share my story and hopefully it empowers and encourages you or um, just gives you uh, inspiration to try something new. Um, so first and foremost to both you, um, the listeners, and then the land that we are on. Um, I'm in Juneau, Alaska right, right now, uh, zooming into this uh, session. Um, so let me first begin by saying um, and in this way I'd like to or and in this way I'd like to um, let you know this is how I am a native woman and this whole presentation is kind of a compilation of that story I'm going to tell you. Um, sorry, this Zoom camera is in my way. Um, so my name is Brittany Jean. I am Dene. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am from Indian Walls, Arizona. Um, I work as a graphic designer and industrial designer. And once you get we get going, you'll see how that kind of overlaps all the time. And I think as you women in the group who are entrepreneurs and business women understand that you play probably uh, multiple uh, roles in your career. Um, I am currently a master's student in the Industrial Design 3 Plus program at Arizona State. Um, I work as a teaching assistant uh, for the Herberger School of Design and uh, for Turning Points Magazine um, as a graphic designer. Um, things I like to do, I like to go running, I like to tell stories, I like to hang out with my puppy and my fiance, um, and I really like being involved in Native entrepreneurship and ideas and just if it's an idea, I love to grow it. The bigger, the better. Um, those are some of my pictures, um, me being kind of a strange kid. Um, but typically, this is what uh, an infographic resume looks like. Um, this is something you would see a graphic designer do. Um, it's not the fanciest one, but this, for me, when I go into an interview, does not show who I am and the culture that has shaped me or the women or the people behind me who support me. And I think it's really important for indigenous people to tell their story in a different way. Um, because while this is visually nice to look at, you know, it's a timeline, it's linear, that's not how life moves. That's not the stories we carry. It doesn't show our real life experiences. It shows the hoops we jump through, but it doesn't show, um, you know, a person. So um, that's what I want to share with you today, what that might look like for someone um, in my age demographic. So to start, <laughs> I'll do a little bit uh, about me just to get the embarrassing pictures out of the way. I call this my Ed years. So that means little girl or like girl in Navajo. And um, I grew up with a bowl cut. Um, yeah, and I was the one at the rodeo wearing shorts. So if you're familiar with rodeo culture, it's very big in um, Navajo culture. We 
it um, you probably shouldn't wear um, shorts. And there's my beautiful sisters, they're rodeo queens, and then there's me. So that gives you a, an idea of where I, where I kind of stand. Uh, and then growing up, I participated in a lot of uh, cultural things, like something that meant a lot to me was my coming of age ceremony, which is my kinota. Um, and that picture in the center is me, um, I think maybe on the third or fourth day, and I was tired and sweating um, after my runs. And the rest is just kind of how I grew up between the city, between the res, on the road. Um, that was what my childhood looked like. And it actually really influenced who I would become today. Um, I ended up going to college at U of A. Um, I really love math and science, and I just love the idea of helping my community. It convinced me that I needed to go into healthcare because I was just really convinced that was the only way I could give back to the community I so loved. Um, and so I ended up getting my BS in nutritional sciences with my minors in chemistry and biochemistry. And the goal at the time was to get into medical school. Um, um, but on the side, there was still a whole nother person. And I don't think people talk about this with Native people, about how, you know, we enter this professional world, but there's this whole other side that people are not tapping into that um, as like institutions and people of power really could, you know, listen and grow from. And so while I was in college, you know, I was going home, I was planting, I was trying to mix modern and traditional. And I essentially just termed that, that title, a traditional millennial. And um, you know, I go into these places that are super robust in their like professionalism. And then I think about home and just being in my skirt and making a fry bread or, you know, standing up for something I believe in as a native person. That was, that was happening at that time. Um, and then I graduated, I entered the workforce and I, again, the goal was to become a doctor, a physician assistant, but I got burnt out between having to get X amount of hours to even be considered an, an applicant to these schools, um, testing, volunteer hours. I was working in a laboratory in genetics research. I worked in a clinic. And honestly, that was not the life I wanted to live. I felt so far removed, even though I was working for Native researchers, I was working for Native clinics, I still did not feel a part of my community. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that, the people I was, you know, the patients were broken or any of that. It was like the whole system was broken. I just couldn't see myself going in there. Um, and these pictures to the right you see here are actually pictures of me at work because I always volunteered to be like the, the parade committee person. Um, but it was kind of like interesting to see that I, I was always covering my face at work. I was like so unhappy maybe that I was just like finding ways to put a mask on <laughs> of some sort. Um, but <laughs> my escape was actually, um, I grew up knowing how to sew for my mom and, you know, learning about materials and textiles. And I quickly became um, invested in friends projects. So I was, um, if you know OXDF's clothing there, um, Jared's actually my roommate and a really good friend of mine. And I've always sewn for him. I've always tried to help him with some of the materials questions. And this is all stuff I learned from my mother or my aunts who are always teaching me. And so I found ways to still help my community, um, but it wasn't the way I thought it was gonna be. Um, so these are also projects at the time. I always say sewing saved my life because that's what I fell back on when I was kind of miserable in that giant head I was uh, showing you. Um, that's my grandma spending a lot of time with her and just kind of seeing her work gave me a little bit of courage um, to make kind of my own things. That's my friend Chelsea in the middle. I made her outfit for her. And that's me making a ridiculously huge over the top outfit because I felt like it. Um, and then actually this... Thing that really solidified it for me um, was going to an awards banquet, my, um, a post-humorous awards banquet for my uncle who passed away when I was a kid. Um, and one of the things he was quoted saying um, is, I want my art to be a mark in history I, of who I was and the kind of jewelry I make. And for me, it just in that moment kind of said, okay, why are you running from this history? Why are you running from something that feels so natural and healing to you? Um, so my grandma's a weaver. We have silver smiths in my family. Um, my sister in the picture is sitting with my grandma at a booth. That's something we 100% know the life of, like um, the hustle life when it comes to being a vendor. Um, so I ended up uh, kind of reflecting back on this picture. And this is us setting up 
to sell, to vend, to be entrepreneurs at a young age. And that is not something school taught me. That is something life experience taught me. And I think as Indigenous people, we have so much experience that we don't know how to put it on paper. It's just so much. We can't quantify it. And I think that's where we need to tell these stories and we need to tell other people to tell these stories. Um, but that's me in the middle. <laughs> So then I went on this manic spree of making everything. I learned how to make a portfolio, a design portfolio. I learned how to bust apart um, micro dwellings. So I could learn how I sewed more. I learned how to braid my hair different. Like I did everything to learn how to make myself do something. Um, I even took up the opportunity to be on a book cover. That was 100% something I would never do but it challenged me to like not be afraid of my own image or who I'm becoming. Um, and started sketching more and there's my nephew um my mom and i worked on his little outfit he's wearing that he, and he was in a little uh traditional pageant um let's see um okay and so second part of gaining a new fire was working finding other indigenous people like me so my roommate jared actually asked me to go to portland with him and he, um, my friend Lacey lived there. She wasn't a friend at the time, but we became friends. She worked at Nike and um, we just met new people. We were there for um, the Native Fashion Now. I think my, oops, uh, for Native Fashion Now, um, which was an exhibit showing what Native Fashion is now, uh, whether it's modern, traditional. It was a beautiful exhibit curated by Karen Kramer at the Peabody Essex Museum. I later would be inspired to apply to the Peabody Essex Museum um, internship as a merchandising uh, intern. And that happened after all of this. Um, but just being inspired by, you know, that work, my roommate's work, um, uh, and by Lacey, who works at Nike and is an industrial designer, I decided to apply to the industrial design master's program at ASU. And industrial design is essentially product making in a traditional sense, but it is not just product making. We make systems, we use design thinking to understand and research and build and kind of uh, meet the needs that people need. And that could be through systems, through apps, through products, um, yeah. And so let me show you a little bit of my work and then I'll hand the mic over to Nikki. Um, so a lot of the stuff we do might look like this. I do research. Um, I can sit and listen to people for eight hours talk if that's required of me and I will write down every single note. Um, I need to know how to sketch. So oftentimes you'll see me just trying to design something um, quickly and get that out through a line of communication and that would be through sketching. Um, I'm familiar with CAD 3D printing uh, to develop things and understand size structure. Um, we do final renderings so to know what something will look like um, realistically. And it could start from a very simple drawing and idea and change completely. Um, so this is my kind of like homage to being an indigenous and industrial designer. I tried making um, a baby carrier um, a little more modern and I'm not quite done with it. It's still in the process, but it was just an idea to run with. Um, my department is soft goods. So this is what something um, soft good, like a soft good product would look like. This is um, the person I collaborated with to actually make this backpack here. Um, and it is manufacturable and able to go to the market. Um, and this is non-academic stuff I've worked on. Uh, my, Jer my, Jared, my roommate Jared and I have worked um, on creating clothing. He does a lot of pattern and graphic work. So the images on the left are the, um, is the outfit I constructed for him as a technical designer. And then on the right, my mom and I work to uh, create uh, my traditional outfit that I like to wear. Um, other projects I've been part of as part of um, a soft goods designer um, helping establish like a native flair in modern clothing or you know give a update to traditional wear like my friend in the middle she is uh, a Sinboy Sioux and Shoshone Paiute. Other times it, being an industrial designer or a designer looks like um, going back to analog drawings and helping with costume <laughs> designs um, that can jump into graphic design. Um, this is some graphic design work I actually work on quite a bit um, to kind of reframe uh, native narratives. Um, this is a design that I worked with two other native women on to design a blanket for the American Indian Graduate Center um, so they can sell and raise money um, for their 50th anniversary and to raise money for scholarships. 
Um, and then that led me, once I entered ASU, to Turning Points Magazine, where I can use my skills as a graphic designer and, um, you know, my creativity to help students. And so Taylor gave us a brief overview about it, uh, about what Turning Points is. This is kind of a sneak preview to our um, issue. The left is the issue, the new and upcoming fourth issue. On the right, we have um, a piece that I wrote, and it was just about using my previous knowledge in health to say, hey students, this is how you look at an insurance card. This is what you need to go to the doctor because those are skills people don't tell you. And um, maybe non-native people know this, but I know there are a lot of native people who might not be familiar. So we use this um, as a tool to connect with students. Um, and I just wanna say, yeah, thank you for having me tell this really quick story about how I came to be um, a native entrepreneur, I guess. I just wanna say thank you to the grandmas who taught us to weave, to her sheet, to the moms and aunties who taught us to sew, to the dads and uncles who showed us how to use tools, to the burrito ladies who taught us how to hustle, to the brothers, sisters, and cousins who believed in us, and to the friends and res puppies who always showed up. Thank you so much. That was pretty amazing, uh, Brittany. And I think my question to you, like really quick before we go to the story of Nikki, is like the, when you are growing up and you go into college, and I don't know if you were the first, the first person in your family who actually graduates from college, do you, have, do you feel like kind of pressure or what makes you like choose what path that you're gonna show? And then when you are there, you realize that you need to look at the broader picture, like you mentioned, the influence of your family in order to continue the path that you want to follow in life. Um, I always, I was always told, I guess, I don't know if it's a native thing, like go and climb that ladder or something, um, but they're always telling us like, get educated. Um, and so I knew I just wanted to go to college. I wanted to learn something that I had no knowledge about. And I wanted to find a way to give back to my community um, and feel a part of my community. And a lot of times when you enter professional workspaces that immediately gets eliminated. Um, so to feel pressure, I felt mostly pressure to exist in kind of both situations. And I think, you know, reflecting back on my family and the people around me um, who are native and are in my network was really, really helpful. Um, to be that professional person and, you know, we need to support each other in that way. Yeah, thank you. I want to like pass the baton now to Nikki and if you can start your presentation and at the end we're going to have a Q&A for the two ladies. Yeah, thank you so much, Brittany. Um, let me, yeah, let me get my screen up. Okay, so just wanna make sure, actually, I don't know what happened there. Are you guys able to see? Mm-hmm. The PowerPoint, the full PowerPoint. We're in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that what you guys are seeing? That's so weird. There you go. Okay, all right. Um, so um, I wanna thank uh, Project Dreamcatcher, Denora and Taylor for um, inviting me to come participate in um, this webinar. Um, I'm really, I was actually really like nervous and um, initially I think when Taylor asked me, I was uh, kind of cautious, like is there other people, like, cause I always, for me personally, like I, I wanna make sure that I'm also sharing the stage and allowing other people who, you know, um, to have the spotlight in some cases. And um, sometimes it's also 
you know, can be a little nerve wracking to, to like have to talk about yourself. Um, and so um, I'm just really thankful that I get the opportunity to be able to share a bit about myself and um, my journey. So to start, I want to give an introduction um, in Navajo. Um, so I basically said, my name, I'm Nicolette Deschini Parkers, and I am actually an enrolled member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, I'm also Navajo. I was raised in Winter Rock, Arizona on the Navajo Nation, and that's where I call home. But my mother um, lives on the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Reservation, which is in North Dakota. Um, well, it borders North Dakota and South Dakota, but she lives on the North Dakota side. Um, and this very first photo that you guys are seeing is a landscape photo from the top of a hill, um, a hill that's very close to where my mother was born. Um, it overlooks the confluence of the Cannonball River and the Missouri River. It's at the very edge of our tribal's um, colonial boundaries. And to the left, you see this statue that's titled Not Afraid to Look. It was designed and built there um, temporarily by Charles Rancourt, who um, built it during the um, pipeline protests that were happening on the Cannonball Reservation back in 2016. Um, and I share this photo because uh, I kind of have come to uh, find that statue and the purpose of the statue, Not Afraid to Look. This statue was purposefully designed to be where it, where it was at, to look straight across. Um, across, if you can, I don't know if you can quite see in this picture, but what he's staring at across the river bank is on the other hill is the site of the pipeline where it was being um, built. Um, and so I have personal ties and connection to um, this land, it's my mother's land, but also my relatives, my ancestors used to live actually down um, below the, the hill before the river was flooded by um, the federal government. And when our family was flooded by the federal government um, to build the river, to expand the river, the Missouri River, um, they had to leave their houses and um, were provided housing on top of the hill um, a little bit more further inland. Um, but I share this story because it's um, a story, as, as you'll see in my, my photos that I sh I'm sharing with you today, that um, I grew up with uh, on constantly being told the history of our people, of Native people. Um, and so my understanding of the federal Indian law um, has been very influential in my life. Um, I remember hearing the story, my mom telling me the story as young as like elementary school. Um, whenever we would go home to visit family, she would tell me about this. We would always go to these areas to um, gather berries down by the riverbank. Um, and so it's something that sort of has always been in my life, um, this, the influence of federal Indian policy and how um, the federal government and these policies have impacted our lives as Native people. Um, so a little bit kind of a background about myself that um, I hope comes out in my presentation is, um, I mentioned I am Standing Rock Sioux in Navajo. I grew up in Wind Rock, Arizona. Um, I graduated from Winter Rock High School in 1999 and came to ASU for my undergraduate degree um, and then started a family here in the Valley and continued to work um, for the state government and eventually decided I wanted to go back to school. So I went back and got my master's of social work in 2010. Um, I worked for ASU for a number of years and then decided to go back to school again um, and I obtained a master's of public policy in 2017. Um, I'm currently a PhD student in a justice studies program at ASU in the School of Social Transformation. Um, I consider myself professionally to be a policy analyst and a program evaluator. Um, and the, my work kind of intersects around federal Indian policy, American Indian health disparities, um, digital activism, and I do things like researching native Twitter and native memes. <laughs> um, and my work has sort of my, my personal journey, my personal like upbringing and my educational career and the work that I do has really um, centered around this idea of like how Native Americans are represented in various spheres. So whether that's represented in government, 
whether it's re how we're represented in media, um, how we're represented in entertainment. Um, so I came around to deciding to start a website called redstreetgirl.com. And initially it was a place kind of like a diary where I talked about these different types of representations and how I personally was navigating them. Um, and then slowly it evolved into a business. So it is a lifestyle blog um, and I do content creation. I also am a designer of hard enamel pins. Um, and then I also take on side work with um, different companies and organizations to provide um, content creation for them. This is a photo of my grandfather's home site on the Navajo Nation. My, um, he passed away a few years ago, but um, this is like out near Den Hotso, um, which is um, up near Kienta for, um, which is kind of like around the Monument Valley area for people who might not know. Um, and when I think of home, this is what I think of. This is an area where my father is from. Um, and so, um, I constantly am thinking about, um, you know, how and where I'm come, where I come from. And if we think about uh, what I mentioned to you about how federal Indian policy kind of impacts my life, you can see in the far left uh, behind the Hogans way far in the distance are some power lines. Um, and so we have had power going through um, the Navajo Nation for generations decades and my grandfather's Hogan, my, my family's Hogan, my family, um, extended family are further to the left of the Hogan, but they don't have electricity. Um, and so, you know, these are the consequences of um, different types of policies that have impacted our people forever. Um, and so it's things like that, how our individual lives have been shaped by federal Indian law and federal Indian policy that um, have kind of really led me to the work that I do. These are my parents. Um, to the left is my mom, Greta Kanaka, and to the right is my father, Albert Deschini. Um, and they really did instill with me from a very young age, um, different types of values. So um, I, uh, my dad works for, worked, he was, he's retired now, but he worked for the Navajo Nation tribal government um, in the inner workings at one point in time, he was a chapter president. But, um, so I've kind of always had this like connection to um, tribal governance. Um, my mom right now, after the pipeline protests um, had decided to um, run for office and so she's not on our tribe's tribal council, but she's um, our district chairperson. So kind of very similar to um, like the Navajo Nation chapter presidents, that's kind of like what she is. She's a, a chairperson for our district. Um, but some of the things that kind of like stick with me and have really shaped um, my upbringing is that, these are photos of me as a kid, <laughs> but um, uh, is that my mom, when I was really young in elementary school, I remember that she would constantly be doing things on the side. She always kept herself busy. Um, she was a stay at home mom, but she was always involved in something. She was my Girl Scout troop leader. She started our Girl Scout troop on the reservation. And I think it was like the first Girl Scout troop um, in the eighties. Um, and we were also at one point in time, the largest cookie, um, Girl Scout cookie, delivery, I guess, or we had like made like a top level of selling cookies at one year, one particular time. Um, but she was always doing things like uh, baking. She always made really great cinnamon rolls, banana bread, zucchini bread, and she would take them to all the different tribal government offices and sell them. And so I have these memories of like walking along beside her and seeing how she would sell. And those types of skills became really important for me when I became a Girl Scout and had to sell Girl Scout cookies. And I remember she would tell me like, I'm not going in there with you. You have to go by yourself. Or if we had to sell Girl Scout cookies at the bank, like I would sit there. I mean, she was there because we had to have a chaperone, but um, she didn't do any of the selling. It was all on me and the other Girl Scouts that were at the booth. Um, my parents got a divorce when I was in high school and um, my dad became a single father, but he, being that he, who he was, um, he was constantly busy and always involved in um, other kinds of 
things outside of the homes, like he was chapter president, he was doing consulting work on the side. Um, and I feel like I've gained a lot of my ability to um, want to take on work and to do stuff um, outside of my one track career um, from him and from like, I guess that sort of resilience of like having to stay busy and having to uh, make sure that the needs of our family were being met because I know that he was doing that. Um, these are photos of me from middle school um, on the far left in the middle is me as a high school royalty and then on the far right is um, me when I was a congressional intern in Washington DC for a summer. Um, I'm very thankful that I've had the educational um, career that I've had um, and getting two master's degrees and being in graduate school right now in a doctoral program. Um, you know, these types of educational opportunities have definitely afforded me other kinds of opportunities. Um, so the middle photo is me from last summer. Um, I was, had the opportunity to go to New Zealand to present at a conference, to present my research at a conference, um, and to also learn from the Māori people there. Um, and then the photo of me on the right, um, being in school allowed me to, um, ha gave me some time to be able to reconnect with some of my um, cultural heritage. Uh, my grandmothers on my father's side um, were Navajo rug weavers and so um, I've taken up Navajo rug weaving and that's something that I do. Um, I don't sell my rugs. They're, um, you know, I'm Consider, I consider myself a beginner, although my Navajo rug mentors say I'm not a beginner. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just, I, I really enjoy the practice of like creating um, those rugs. I've never seen myself as an artist in the, the formalized professional sense. Um, but I do acknowledge exactly what Brittany's saying, that we have these creativities that are passed down through our um, heritage that, you know, we can tap into. And I really appreciate that Navajo Reaving has allowed me to do that for myself. Um, also being back in school as a doctoral student and working within the Center of Indian Education at ASU, I had the opportunity to be a part of the ASU Turning Points magazine this past year. Um, and um, being a content creator and helping out with um, developing content for our podcast. Um, as well as helping to write a story for the upcoming magazine that's coming out. I'm really thankful that Taylor has allowed me to come and be a part of that and to um, listen to some of my ideas. We have the podcast. Um, it's available, like, if you have, like, Apple Podcasts, you guys can listen to some of our, our um, podcast episodes. And then, as I had mentioned at the very start, I had started my personal, um, my lifestyle blog, and my social media company, Red Street Girl. Um, so these are just kind of screenshots of my website, redstreetgirl.com, and my Instagram page. Um, I provide um, content that's kind of focused on the life, on lifestyle, but also at the intersection of, you know, Indian country, <laughs> Indian country life. I like to feature Native American businesses. Um, and I also talk about um, justice, so an injustice and inequality in Indian country. Um, so yeah, but all of those kind of, everything is kind of like, you know, culminated over my experiences as a kid and then um, my experiences through education and my career. And I'm just really happy that, um, you know, I've had this thread of representation kind of throughout my life that I've been able to cultivate into the person I am today and the type of work that I do professionally and creatively. Um, so yeah, this is my information. Um, I um, do other types of work on the side, like I do policy analysis on the side. Um, but there's my website, redstreetgirl.com, and my email address in case anybody has questions. I'm always open to mentoring other um, people, Native students especially. Um, so if you have like kids that are interested in going to ASU and have questions or um, graduate students that are looking into graduate programs or anybody they want to talk about entering a doctoral program, I mentor um, and I talk with lots of uh, Native students across the United States. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. That was great. I think you guys are so inspiring 
and just listening to your stories is, uh, it really, really warms my heart just to see that all the influence, I, I, I always think that uh, to raise a child, it takes a village and, you know, like just, you are the, the pride of your community, of your families and the representation matters. Like seeing you succeed is, is important. And I think it's important for anybody who's attending this webinar. If you have a kid, if you have uh, somebody they, they look up to you, whatever you do is going to influence them in how they're going to become in the future, who the, the kind of people they're going to be in the future. And uh, this is the, the perfect example, like these ladies have been having um, the impact and the influence of their parents, their, their uncles and their grandparents and everybody that is in their lives is just leading to who they are today. And it's uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It's, it's very personal and it's very moving. And thank you for, for this. I'm going to open the floor now. And if anybody has a question or anybody wants to, we have like, like many comments here, like saying, the, Brittany, you have so many amazing projects. Your work is inspirational. That's, yeah, I agree. Uh, my background is in graphic design. I totally agree. Then going from uh, healthcare to design is just, <laughs> it blows my mind, honestly. Um, phenomenal career, Br Br Brittany. And um, also, Nikki, uh, you guys are true inspiration. Valentina is saying that love your uh, representation. Anybody with a question? I have a question. My name is um, Jacqueline Hostin. I'm the owner of I Need Sugar Cake Specialty Shop in Gallup, New Mexico. So I kind of jumped on a little late, but I appreciate what you shared and what I've heard. But um, I just wanted to ask you, like, I guess I, I have a lot of issues, not issues, but personal, I guess, personal, because I have a business here. I'm Native American, full Native American, educated woman. So I've been and I've lived in the metro area. Going to, I went to school there, I graduated there. My daughter grew up there, my oldest, who is 24 now. Then I have my, my son, he's 14, then my daughter's 13 and they go to school here in Gallup. But they grew up on the reservation, which is Windorock, Arizona, when I was working out there as a technician or for the hospital as an IT. So now that I own my own business, it's hard for me to be political in any manner. And I guess Gallup with it being, you know, a border town, I understand, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it is a border town. People do ignore the issues that, you know, concern that, that are a concern right now. But when I've been here and located at my location for the last four years, and how do you separate your personal uh, opinions with your work? Because you have, it's kind of like a blog that you have almost, right? On your website. So you kind of, point out a lot of different things on your thing, like your opinion of certain products or things like that. So when it comes to something that's political, do you, do you, how do you, how do you separate yourself from that? Knowing that you're Native American, knowing that you're educated and not having to ignore it, you want to be involved, but you can't be involved because you're going to get backlash either way. Yeah, so I can, um, I can speak, um, and then maybe, I don't know if Brittany has anything else to add as well. Um, so I totally, so I, I don't know if you caught the very beginning of my presentation, but um, I'm from Windrock as well, and I totally know Gallup. Um, and I don't have a, um, like, I'm not a business that, like, goes into, that has to deal with, like, many, many clients um, that aren't there specifically to see me. Um, so I'm not sure if like, for example, you mentioned your business, uh, um, is a cake business, a bakery. Yeah. Um, so you have to, you know, go into the community, into your town, and you have to serve, you know, the public, um, whoever that might be. 
Um, and I kind of have a little bit of a different um, ability the way that my business is set up. Um, mm -hmm. So my website is a lifestyle blog and I provide information that, you know, is my, some of it is my opinion. Some of it is information about um, my thoughts on the intersections between federal Indian policy and uh, Indian country. Um, and the clients that I am able to work with, because I do get clients, um, just to give you all an example, one of my clients is downtown Tempe Authority. Um, here in Tempe, the city of Tempe, they manage all of the um, businesses and um, that are down here in downtown Tempe. Um, and I have a contract with them. And part of my stipulations is them knowing up front that I um, will never back down from my position in terms of injustice. And I don't see issues of political things like, um, I don't see the issues that American Indians face as political. I do see them as issues of equality and equity. Um, and so things around federal Indian policy and how they dis despair American Indians our living conditions, our access to water, to technology, to resources, um, how the federal government has um, stripped Native Americans of certain type of rights. I see those as human rights, issues of human rights, human issues and not necessarily political. Um, I do, however, on my Instagram page, which is my personal page, my personal page for my business, um, it's cultivated around my identity as a person. And so I am able to provide that type of platform for myself or I am able to put out the type of things that I believe in um, there. But at the same time, if you think about it, there are companies all across the United States that have in some way, shape or form provided some type of influence of their personal beliefs into their company. We have companies like um, Hobby Lobby, for example, Christian base that don't provide that don't believe in providing um, right to choose for women. And so um, that's just as one example. I'm not going to get into many more just because um, of this particular space. And I want to be able to um, honor the space here for Project Dreamcatcher. But, um, you know, there are companies out there that put what their beliefs are. We have companies now more national companies and a little bit less um, as divisive companies like Tom's who, you know, they make a decision to be a social enterprise where every pair of shoes that you buy, they donate a pair of shoes to a child in need in a third world country. And so I think that there are definitely ways to structure some businesses to be somewhat, um, you know, to lean into the type of values and beliefs that you might have, but also at the same time being very cognizant of the type of situation and what your community is and, and what you need to do to be able to make your business survive. Because I definitely know Gallup. Um, I have experienced many acts of racism, overt racism and microaggression. Um, and so I also understand the need to be able to like provide for your family and to, you know, if, if that means having to hold some of that back, um, I understand that too and acknowledge that in some cases that's what needs to be done. Um, just to chime in at the end of that, I 100% agree with what you're saying, Nikki, um, in the sense that whoever I work with, they know I'm Native. That's the first thing that anyone pretty much knows about me, um, whether it's what I wear, what I say, the work I put out that people see. Um, I can see how your industry is a little different. You are a bakery in Gallup, um, so you do have perishable foods, but one thing that I, that probably could um, go from my work to your work um, is having a network. Um, whether it's in Gallup, whether it's surrounding cities, whether it's online, like find that, find those people who are just like you. And if someone says something bad, if someone says something to you, whatever happens, like lean on them. That's what they're there for. And I think as Native people, like we can be so strong together. And as soon as we tap into that, like we're unstoppable. Um, and as far as like- It sounds like you're really proud of like, you know, where you're from, where you're from where you're from where you're from your family and your culture. Yes, it's, you know, as some really political and you can't really separate it. I think it's something you really can use to your advantage. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. It is hard. It is one of those that I've been battling. Like, obviously, I want to protect my kids, for one, because they are in this community. And for two, all my customers, I mean, a lot of my customers are you know, uh, non-native, but 
like probably 95% of my customers are native. When we had the shutdown here, it was, it was really insane how much of this town depends on all of the native community with around this community. So it is kind of hard. I try not to step on anybody's toes, but I know a lot of people personally that work in the school system in the, as well as the court system and the police system, as well as the, the medical field. I get orders from all over the place. So I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I still have my beliefs. And also I have my own Facebook with my personal views. Then I have my business page, which is just business, you know, so if somebody tries to tag me on something and I always get have to get approved, give approval first before it's even on there. But even LGBT right now is a really big thing because this is LGBT month. So I want to highlight that. But then you're always going to have the people that are going to be like, you know, the Mormon and the Christian and the, you know, that don't believe in that. So I hate to talk about politics or this kind of racial, you know, separation and stuff. But these are things that make me who I am and where I glow when I have to put it out there, you know? And it is also my market. So it's just hard to decide those things, but thank you so much for your time, ladies. Thank you, Jackie, for your question. Um, we have another question. Andrea is asking if you can share some of the secrets to your success or any tips that you have to overcoming obstacles. I think one of the biggest things that I've faced, um, as you've seen my career shift and things change, um, is being uncomfortable, like being okay with being uncomfortable. Um, there are times that, I mean, um, how do I say? Uh, there are times that I maybe don't know the full extent of what I'm doing, but that's okay. That, that means I'm learning and I'm growing. And I think that you have to be okay with, you know, you, um, go into a mindset of this is my goal this is what i want but a lot of times people don't end up with that result and you have you can't set your heart on something to have it be broken just because it didn't end up exactly how you imagined sometimes it's bigger and it grows better and you have to be um willing to accept that in your heart that things may not pan out exactly how you imagined but you just need to keep going and you know um finding finding strength and power in yourself to just continue to march on. And that's, that's, for me, that's worked every single time. And you also got to be open to other people's ideas and thoughts because it, you're not going to get your way every single time. Thank you, Brittany. I'm just kind of built off on that. I also um, kind of think that um, for me, it's also kind of about taking little steps. Um, so to build Red Street Girl to what it is today to like, you know, be able to get a contract with the city. Um, I didn't come out of out in my business like doing that. Um, I like made the first initial step of getting of writing a post. And then once I wrote my very first post, I didn't even have a website to publish it on yet. You know, it's just saved in my Word document. And then I built a website. And then it wasn't a fancy website. It was a free website. Um, and then eventually, you know, I got a few more posts on there and then I went and I built like a, the web, a website and, um, like paid for my own domain. Like I took all these little tiny steps to get to, to build it up. Um, but also recognizing that at each one point in time, those steps weren't like perfect. My product that I developed wasn't perfect. It took some time to be able to get to what it is today and also constantly putting myself out there, um, constantly pushing forward, um, this is the second year that I've had this contract with Downtown Tempe Authority. Um, it's one of my more lucrative contracts and um, it took me time to even get to this point in time because I remember reaching out to them um, a few years ago as a smaller, I had like a smaller web presence and was kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, not quite ready. I wasn't, I wasn't there yet and that was, you know, fine. And sometimes hearing that hurts, you know, that something, we might not be ready or we feel that maybe we failed in some way. Um, and it's always important to just sort of like get back up on 
get back up, stand back up and like push forward and kind of take it as, um, you know, something to learn from. I feel like it's kind of been one of the hardest things for me is having to learn from um, my mistakes or the things that I feel that I failed at um, and then having to push forward through them. And on the same note, Nikki, we have a question from April that she's asking, what are the top applications that help you to do what you, what you do? For example, like uh, Salesforce or Candly or what, what is it that you do in order to do your job? So I can share real quick and then uh, maybe Brittany can also share. So um, I have a, um, I run my website, which is through WordPress. Um, and I use, I have a filing system on my computer to where I um, work on all my drafts of my blog posts or my content creation. Um, I use a lot of apps on my phone. Um, so things like the WordPress app, I use notes. Um, and I have different kinds of photo editing applications. But one of the things that kind of helps me, because I saw somebody else's comment was like, when do, you, do we ever sleep? Um, yeah, I sleep and I've got kids also, although my kids are like much older now. Um, but one of the other things I do is I actually have like hard planners um, that help me to where I basically plan out the different types of tasks that I want to do and accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish. And then I break down everything into like what I have to do to get things done. Um, I have tried different kinds of um, application softwares that like, you know, do those type of um, goal and task assignments. But for me personally, having it on something hard and physical like really helps me. Um, so that way I can take it around when I, you know, if I'm sitting at like the t in front of the TV on my chair and like, have an idea, I can either just like make a note on my phone, but um, having like a physical planner really, really helps me. Um, although I totally believe like in also taking advantage of technological resources to help. And I have definitely relied on some of those in the past. So kind of like Nikki said, um, you kind of have to know who you are, how you think, how you get stuff done. I just um, invested into Mailbird, which has my Slack channel on there, it has uh, my LinkedIn on there, it takes care of my mail and my calendar. And if anyone knows me, I live and die by this calendar um, on my phone. So if you ever send me an email invite, um, that's like the sexiest thing you could do for me because it automatically just programs it into my calendar. Um, but one thing to stay on design on top of design projects is I made my own bullet journal because I'm a little weird like that. And it's just um, a journal out of 11 by 17 that I sewed together. And right in the middle is where all the due dates are. Wait, let me find the middle. <laughs> um, so if you take a peek at this, it's just the month. So it keeps me on track for the month, like what I'm doing, where I'm going, here are my notes. Um, and then this is where I think. For a lot of people, it might be hard to put um, uh, words down, but for me, it's just like, it has to all be in one spot. That's, my mind's always going. So I always carry this with me um, and then use just a regular calendar app on my phone to just kind of keep me in check with meetings, um, make sure I get back with people. As far as apps, sometimes I get a little overwhelmed by them or I won't open them. Like I really like Slack, but um, I just, I don't open it. But putting it in my mailbox for me has been super helpful. Denora, we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry guys. Um, we, I was just mentioning that I, I want to thank you for spending the, the, this hour with us and sharing your stories. They are super interesting, super inspiring. And uh, this is a very good for, especially for, for mothers that they work really hard with their businesses and they have kids and they're raising them. And like I mentioned before, um, everything that you do has an impact directly with the, the people that you love. And when you work really hard and you do it with love, uh, that gives like, you know, like people just like you, you know, like that you developing these young, strong women, and now you are having your own families and 
having your own careers and your own businesses is, is pretty inspiring and amazing. So I wanna thank you for being here today and everybody for taking the time today. And thank you for um, Andrea that she's here from um, Freeport today and everybody and the participants and the attenders. Thank you for spending this hour with us and we'll see you probably next week if you have the time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Have a good afternoon.